Uh, today, I want to talk to you. We're in our second week of this house. Last week, we said we are never finished. This week, our core value is better together. Look at the person next to you and say, I love you. I love you. Now, if you're sitting next to a stranger, sorry for making that awkward. But you may have just found a new friend or your soulmate, one or the other. And, uh, and so I, I, I love this idea of being better together. I, I work with a group of people that one of, their, one of their slogans is that doing more together than we could do alone. Doing more together than we could do alone. And, and I love the phrasing, but how many of you in your personality type are more wired like, I could probably do more by myself than I could with others. Anybody got that type of personality? Hands up. Put them way up if that's you. It's okay. Uh, you don't have to be embarrassed by it. How, how, many, how many of you are, would, you would say, Pastor Vince, I don't like people. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> now, the person that you just looked at and said, I love you too, they now know you lied. Okay. <laughs> so, not everybody are people people. Uh, how many of you are the kind of people like you can do people for a while, but then you get just, there's like a, like a switch that flips and you're like, I can't do people anymore. Amen. Like I just need a, I need a people break. That's, that's just, that's been, my wife, Jennifer, is that way. Uh, she does great in crowds and rooms, and there's not really any, there's not like an anxiety that goes with it. It's just, it's overwhelming when there's a lot of people around. And so about the time Jennifer goes, I need, a, I need a break from people, is about the time I'm like, can we go to a mall? <laughs> there's so many interesting specimens at malls. Or Walmart at certain times of the day. Hey, you get into that PJ section of time at Walmart, it starts to get incredible, all right? And so as, as, as we know, as people were different, some of you are fast-paced, some of you are slow-paced, some of you are people-people, some of you just want to put your nose down, get the job done, and you don't want to deal with people. Some of you isolate when there's too many people. Some of you thrive when there's too many people. The reality is there's a truth that God set out, and that truth was simply this. It is not good for man to be alone. Even, even the best introvert has to have some form of human connection. They have to, on some level or another. Otherwise, communication gets really weird and conversations with yourself are strange. Okay? And so I, I, I want to talk today about just this idea of what God intended for us as people. Because here's, here's what's happened. In our culture, we have this culture that's become quite strange in that it's performance-based. And I mean that by how many of you social media people out there, if you use social media of any kind, raise your hand. Go ahead, put them up, put them up, put them up, keep, put them up keep them up. Some of you are like, I don't know, is this a trick question? Not a trick question. I, just, I, I find it interesting that like now... I use social media to some extent. I'm, I'm more of a, like I don't post much, but I like to read how weird other people are. <laughs> Anybody with me on that? Oh, yeah. You're like, I never say anything, but I want you wackos put stuff out there. <laughs> and it's so funny because I, I, I'll be scrolling through, and, and my boys, they, they crack me up. They're like, oh, you use the old people's social media. I'm like, the old people's social media. And I'm thinking like chat space, chat rooms, and MySpace and stuff, you know. And uh, they're, they're like, no, Facebook. And I'm like, Facebook is the old people thing? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just so some of you know, Instagram is an old people thing too now. Because it's already changing. What blows me away is that all of it, it could be considered old people and it's yet only about 20 years old. And I'm thinking, man, that means like a, if that's old people, like that's a classic. Like Facebook is the classic. So like Facebook is a 57 Chevy. So like what they're thinking of as old is like 90s. And that's hard for me. But yeah. I'm sitting here and I, as I think about that, what you see on social media is we've been taught by culture that 
We perform. We perform for people on social media. We put the good stuff out there. We shine, we, man, we shine it up real good. Hey, look at my kids. Aren't they so awesome? And we wait till we've spent 35, 40 minutes, an hour getting them all dressed and the bow tie just right. And then we're like, be still, snap. Look at my little ones. Knowing full well they're eating the paint off the wall. <laughs> right? You know, or you guys know that filtered world, right? Here's the reality. Somebody's going to get mad at me for this, but it's okay. I've had people mad at me before. No one, no one on the planet has a need to have pictures of themselves on their own phone. I can hear some of you right now. You don't really know what to say, so you're just making noise. Because we don't, we don't post it for the picture. We don't post it so people will see what we look like. They know what we look like. We post it so we will hear what they say about what we look like. It's so gorgeous. Look at how beautiful you are. I can't believe my eyes. Fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji. <laughs> And so we perform more, so we perform more, so we perform more. And the reality is, and, e- and then even you have those people that take that to the next level, and, and, and it's not just the good stuff they share, but it's all the junk that happens in their life. And they're not sharing their stuff to vent. They're sharing so that they have other people jump on the wagon with them, pity-wise. Oh, I can't believe you're going through this. My favorites are the ones where we talk about someone else in our post. I can't believe this person at this store did this to me. And then the comments, oh, I know, I can't believe people today. Nobody knows how to do customer service. This person doesn't even know the person that did it, but they're on the bandwagon, baby. (laughs) Right? Or we throw people groups. These Christians today, written from a Christian today. (laughs) So we... The need is there, but it's performance. We want people to, and I know people right now, some of you young people can relate to this. You will take down a picture that you took because it didn't get enough likes. Oh, there's only four people that like that one. It must have sucked. Why? Because four people I don't know said it sucked. I don't know. It's scary. But here's the scarier part. The church has become very similar And what I mean is that just like social media, it's not authentic. It's not real. I hope you all understand that. It's not real. You don't have a lot of people being authentic on social media. Even the ones that say they're being authentic are not being authentic on social media. I just want to spend a few moments and share a very real thing in my heart. Even though I've set up the full video production to make sure I'm ready for this moment to share you in my heart. No. And in church, we see the same thing. People come in every day, and we're performing. We're fine. We're good. We're fine. We got dressed good. I know people go, you know, I know. It's, boy, we got 24-foot screens and smoke and drums and lights and all that. It's all about performance, just like you said, Pastor Vince. That's not what I said. This isn't as much performance sometimes as this is. Because we walk in, we got our stuff together, and it's been forever since we've been authentic with anybody. True community is built out of authenticity. It's not built, it's not built because we get together. That's not authenticity, that's, that's a gathering. Gatherings are great, but authenticity builds out of those. Community builds out of those. And so, so I, as I was challenged with this, I, I began to kind of look in and, and go, okay, God, what, what is it that you want for us, though? What do you, what do you intend for us to do as, as followers of you, and, and, and how do we do that? Because I do think there's a pattern that he sets for the church. And I mean the church as a whole. I'm not talking just real life church. Yes, we're a part of that. But I'm talking about the church as a whole. There's a pattern that he sets in Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. That's where we're going to be living today. But as you turn there, there's a lot of great stuff happens in Acts chapter 2. Man, Pentecost comes. The Holy Spirit shows up. Peter gets up and preaches the wood off a stump in front of all these people. 
And they leave that place and they go back into their home countries and they begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in their own languages, in their own countries. And the gospel begins to spread out of that moment in Jerusalem. But there's a moment at the end of the chapter where we start to get the formation of the church. This is what it looks like when the church gets together. Now, some of you I'm going to get in your lunch today, all right? I'm just, it's just going to happen because it got in mine. But the reality of what we need as a church is sometimes to set our own thoughts aside, our own ideas aside, and just kind of face the reality of we're not doing some of this well. And the church is made up of individuals, so we as individuals have to kind of look at ourselves and go, am I doing these things well? Am I actually following through with what Christ has asked me to do, what I see the church doing in this passage? And so as I said, that there's this reality, and I know culture says, well, Pastor Vince, it doesn't matter if the church does it, because I don't know that I need the church as long as I got Jesus. Well, if that's your mindset, you would be doing it absolutely differently than anyone in the New Testament. And so what you're saying, that your faith is stronger than that of Peter, James, Paul, John, Barnabas, Timothy, Jude, those guys that wrote the New Testament, if you say, because you have Jesus, you don't need the church, you're on a different level than even those guys. Because in the New Testament, I want you to see this, there is absolutely no concept of unchurched faith in the New Testament or in the book of Acts. Your faith doesn't grow in the deer stand. Share how quiet that got? I almost heard a rifle cock. <laughs> I'm not saying, I, I love the deer stand. But please don't let that be your excuse. That's not where your faith is going to grow. You may have quiet time with the Lord there. Okay? I'm not saying you can't do that. But it's not where your faith is going to grow. Throughout the New Testament and throughout the church history, your faith grows when you're together. When you're with people of faith. And so it's, it's an important thing. We see people coming back to church. We see those kind of things happening. I actually believe, I don't get, I don't get hyped up much about national com- campaigns, but I believe even in the church world, when I call it the church world, I mean the subculture of church itself. I think today is actual national come back to church Sunday. I'm like, I never left. And so I, I hope that if you came back today, that I pray that God begins to speak to your life and you go, you know what, I need this in my life. I need the people around me. I even need the weirdo that just told me he loved me that I don't know who he is. <laughs> but I even need that person in my life. So I want to just walk through something God intends for you. The first thing is God intends us to do life together. He intended us to do life together. I, I, I hate, I, my personality type, I hate being by myself. Now I can stand it, but I hate it. And I know some of you are very different. You're like, if I just had a week alone with nobody around, that would be heaven. I would tear the wallpaper off the walls. uh, Jennifer and I, when we used to go shopping, she used to not let me go into Walmart with her because I would talk to everybody in Walmart. So I would sit in the car. And she would would laugh because before she got to the door of Walmart, she would turn around and I would already be on the phone talking with somebody because I was just sitting in the car. And I'd call four or five people while she was in there just talk because I had to talk to somebody. And so I understand that not everybody is wired like I am, and I appreciate it. I'm glad for the differences. But God intended you to have people in your life for a couple different reasons. First being, we need community. Second being, you won't be honest with yourself. How many of you can pick out your children's faults? Say amen. How many of you had advice to fix it? Say amen. amen. How many of you can pick out your spouse's faults? Amen. <laughs> how, how many of you other spouses just found a new one? <laughs> we, we can. We're good, man. If you want, I tell this to people all the time. We do a finance class next door at the Reach Center for budgeting and things like that. Here's the reality. I can fix your checkbook. But please don't look at mine. How many of you know that's true? 
Like, I can fix your budgeting issues. I can tell you, you spend way too much money on Netflix, Hulu, Paramount Plus, and, and the list goes on and on and on and on. I can tell you, it's easy for me to go, hey, you, you got a tobacco problem. Stop buying tobacco, you'll save money. That makes perfect sense. Unless you're the one addicted to tobacco, then it gets a little tougher, right? And so the reality is, I can fix these things. What you have in community, when it's a tr- true community, is you have somebody that can speak into your stuff. Because the reality about me, and I'm guessing it's true about you, is you and I will justify our own stuff. We can fix other people's stuff, but I can justify Well, yeah, I know I need to get healthy, but you know what? I'm just so busy. I can make that excuse. But I'm so glad I have friends in my life that go, yeah, are you too busy to live longer for your kids? Well, I don't want to talk about it. Well, you've got to talk about it, Vince. And I need people in my life. And I'm so glad I have people in my life that will do that to me and for me. A lot of people don't understand this, and we see this happening. Bob and I were kind of joking about it earlier. I get tickled at people that don't want to put their kids in conflict situations. This is not the sermon, but I'm going to sidebar for a second. Put your kids in hard situations, please. If you were a parent, once your kid gets to a certain age, your job is to not talk to the coach. Not talk to the coach. Your job is to talk to your child about developing the leadership ability to go have a conversation with that coach on their own. But I just don't want them to deal with conflict. Then you are destroying them for the life to come. Okay? Conflict's going to happen. I need healthy conflict in my life. I need people to go, I disagree with you on that. I love you, but I disagree with you. And our culture is getting further and further and further and further away from the ability to disagree and love. But if we don't begin to teach, this is why community is so important. It's why it's so critical is because I have to have people in my life that disagree with me from time to time or I'm going to always think I'm right. And you know what happens if I always think I'm right? I'm going to get real hard to be around. I'm going to get real arrogant. I'm going to get real expectant and real dependent on everybody bending their world to mine. And sadly, that's not how the world works. And here's the harder truth. It's not how the gospel works. You realize that? The gospel is in straight conflict to me as a human being. It says, no, 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 no. I need you to surrender your will, your decisions in your life to me. That's what I need you to do. If you want this and you want all this, I need you to surrender, man. Surrender what? All of it. All of it. Yeah, all of it. I need you to trust me to lead you in every, my wife, my kids, my job, my success, my dreams, all of it. Lord, it's yours. And if I don't have that kind of conflict in my life, then I get really arrogant and so do you. Parents, put your kids in places they have to make hard decisions and let them cry through it. Let, I'm not saying don't be supportive. Man, I have sat on the porch for hours with my kids as they have wept through hard things been right there for them. But I'll also tell you, as adults, the greatest gift that I gave them was letting them weep through hard things. It wasn't my ability to make things easy. It was them having a community where they could fall down and someone was there to pick them back up. That's what they have. We are better together. God says we're better together. He said it way back in the book of Genesis when it was early on, but this is what he says in the book of Acts, all right? In book of Acts, verse 46 of chapter 2, it says, They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity. That word generosity in the King James says, in singleness of heart. In other words, we got one goal, one mission, and that's to share Jesus with the world, and we're going to do whatever we can with whatever we have to do just that. But we're going to do it together. We're going to do it together because it matters. It matters that we do it together. Loners end up lonely, and when you're lonely, you do strange things. How many of you know that's true? You ever watch some of those TLC shows? Some odd people out there, aren't there? You know, some people are hoarders. They 
They don't have really anything to buy into. They don't have a community to plug into. And so they end up doing whatever just hits their mind at that moment that creates value. And they will place value on odd things. Please don't hear me beating anybody up. Okay? I place value on odd things. I have baseballs in my office that matter to nobody but me. So it's not me beating you up. I just want to make sure you understand that as much as you place value on those things in your life, when you shift that and you place that value on people and you begin to be in community, then your impact expands. That's why we have, I'll just use this, is why we have life groups now in, in Norfolk and Flippin and Bull Shoals and Lakeview and, and, and Cotter. And, and we're, we actually have more outside of Mountain Home than we have in Mountain Home for a church that's in Mountain Home. Why? Because our, our borders are expanding because we're saying, hey, we want to be in community and we want to share this with other people. It's not good for you to be alone, so be in community. The second thing God intends is he intends for us to change through personal growth. What are you doing to grow? You say, I'm coming to church, Pastor Vince. I love you, and I'm thankful you love here. This is not enough. I'm going to give you the four things, the four foundations of the early church. It was instruction, study, fellowship, and prayer. Instruction, study, fellowship, prayer. That's what the church was built on. The disciples' instruction, the churches went home, and they studied in their own house. We do life groups. Other churches do Sunday school. Other churches do alpha groups. Doesn't matter to me how you do it, but here's the pattern. You instruct. You study. In other words, you dig deeper into what it is you're learning. You do fellowship together, so you're growing together, and you bathe it all in prayer. That's how the church grows. It's not complicated. It's never been complicated. We try to mess it up, and we try to make it complicated. It is not. People ask us all the time, they said, why don't we do more things at Real Life Church? I said, we do a lot of things, but we do it two ways. We do it on Sunday mornings or we do life groups. That's it. Well, we need a program for this. Well, you could go start you a program for that. But right now at Real Life Church, we do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. I'd like to start a quilting ministry. No, we do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. I want to start a men's ministry. We do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. I want to start this. We do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. People go, why do you keep it so simple? Because, folks, we are the best at complicating the simple things. Jesus' instructions were never complicated. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And your neighbor. All of the prophets, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two things. It's not been complicated. We do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. I'm going to just tell you, I think our Sunday mornings are better than anybody's. That's just preference, okay? Obviously, you two are the only ones that think that too. So thank you for the rest of you. It's my preference. But I'm going to tell you what, I could leave right now and go sit in church and get with Jesus just as well as I can right here. We do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. What do you do during the week? Because this is not enough. Some of you, it's life groups. Some of you, it's Oprah or whatever it is that, I don't know what you do. Some of you, it's work. Some of you have friends. I don't know what your connection is, but if it's not rooted in Christ, if it's not rooted in Christ, then you're going to end up missing some things. Find some people to connect with. Find a community to connect with. Find a community that will challenge you, but then grow. Study your word. I tell people, bring your Bible, bring your Bible. Pastor Vince, I don't want to bring the Bible because it's going to be on the screen anyway. I can fix that with a push of a button. Literally, I asked Dom already. I don't know how any of that stuff in that room works back there, but I asked Dom. He said it could go away immediately if we wanted to. I want you to study. We've got journals out front now. You can buy a journal that even has a real-life church badge on it so you know this is your church journal. You can take notes on Sunday with it. You can make sure that you're getting something poured into you and you're taking it with you. And it's not just a feel-good hour of, man, that was great. I got my job done. I checked it because, you know, I checked church on Sunday. I checked Kiwanis on Thursday. I checked Rotary on Wednesday. I check. I don't want church to be something you check. It is a thing. It is a power of God unto salvation that has been born into you through the gospel. Amen. It has to be more. Than just your Sunday morning hour yes. that you put in. It has to be more. The reason we've lost that is because the third thing. God not only intended us to do life together, He not only intended us to grow personally, but God intends us to be in awe of Him. When's the last time you were in awe of what God has done? 
I want you to just think about it for a second. Just, just for a second, think about it. Because I, I understand it gets real easy and we get real busy. But I, I think we miss sometimes the reality that some of us have got over what Jesus did in our life. Like we got over it. We were saved, and man, we were, some of you were radically saved out of a life of, of just pain and misery and, and all this, and God saved you out of it, and you kind of got over it. It says daily the people were in awe. Listen to what it says. A deep sense of all, this is verse 43, came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles and signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place. And shared everything they had and sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Deep awe. I just blown away by what God has done. And see, there are moments in my life where I stop for a second. I look at my own life and I go, man, I can't believe that God allowed me to marry Jennifer. In about four weeks, we'll be married 25 years together. Yeah, yeah thank you. But it makes no sense at all. It really doesn't. Because listen, I, I, I appreciate that you all enjoy my speaking because I can make you laugh or I can engage you or I can draw you in or I can make you cry. Somebody said this morning after the 8.30, this third week in a row, Pastor Vince, you're going to cut that stuff out. And I said, are you crying? Yeah, he just got all over me. And I'm like, okay, thanks. Guess what? Not all the times that work well in marriage. To say the funny thing at the wrong time. Anybody with me on that? Yeah, yeah. So, like, I, I, it doesn't make sense. And I, there are days I go, God, I don't know why, but thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you that she has, A, put up with me for this long, and B, she still loves me. My kids. My kids are phenomenal. I got six of them. They're phenomenal. Guess what? It's not a one of them perfect. Thank God. No, I'm serious. If my kids were perfect, you, I would be miserable to be around because I would tell you all the time that they're perfect. But they're not. But what I'm finding out as I get older, that my God, man, why would God give me them? Because every day I'm learning from those kids and they are teaching me things. They are funnier than me. They, they are smarter than I am. All I have is that I still pay some bills and I'm still the biggest one in our family. And they respect me to death because of how I treated them and what I raised them with. My kids are fantastic. And they're flawed. They're awesome. And they're human. And I wonder every day why in the world God gave them to me. When my five-year-old walks in our living room and starts to twerk... Let me just inform all of you about this before you make judgments. I don't know how to do that. I don't know where she learned that. So I'm blaming our children's ministry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But when she walks in and she's dancing, or she wants to show me that cartwheel for the 35th time, you know what I do? I watch. I watched for the 35th time and I go, God, I can't believe you would allow me to be the father of this little girl or the father of these three boys and my two older girls. I get to be big papa to Elena and whatever the new one coming in April's name is going to be. I get to be big papa and I can't, God, I can't get over. God, this church you gave me, I'm blown away that you, this is where I get to come and preach every week and it just doesn't make sense, God. I got no background other than grit. Other than grit and loving you like crazy, Jesus, I got nothing that says we should be in the position that we're in. And yet, because of your goodness and your grace, you say yes. God wants us to be in awe of him. Listen to me, church, please. I want you to get this next part because I think it's really critical that, that we see this. And... Dom, I'm not going to go into that next slide, but I, I want to just kind of hang out on this for a second about being in awe of God. 
This is how the world knows whose we are. Okay? This is how the world knows whose we are. How will they know? They will know you by your love. You can't love something out of a place of intention. And my intention is that God has done so much for me, I have nothing but to pour my life out to him. That's all I got left. I, I don't know what else I can give him. I, I, Lord, whatever you want from me is yours. If you want me to preach, I'll preach. If you want me to, to, to be a missionary, I'll go be a missionary. God, if you want, I, whatever you want me to do, God, I am yours. That's all I have to give you. It's all I have to offer you. It is my everything. See, so what does this have to do with being better together? Here's the thing. When one or two of us figure out how to do that, it grows. It grows. Bob, come here. Philip, if we can hit the lights real quick. It's going to get real dark in here for a second. See, I told you. Now I know who's taking notes on their phone. <laughs> um, can you turn your light on, Bob? How many of you in your life felt like this? Like everything around you, the world around you, the culture around you, and this is you. You just, 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 just the one thing. I'm trying to do it right. I'm trying to get it right. I'm trying to make it right. How many of you felt like that before in your life? Say amen. Okay. Let me show you how the church is supposed to work. Everybody in the room that has a phone, get it right now and turn your flashlight on. Is that everybody? I feel like some of you are holding out on me. I know some of you would have turned around and went back to the house if you forgot your phone. I just want you to know this is how the church is supposed to look. Because here's the thing. Bob, walk with me. Go ahead and turn your light on. Don't fall down the stairs. <laughs> so Bob's walking with me. And some of you have already said this has been you. You have been here in your life before. And here's, here's the struggle. Here's, here's where it gets tough. Because like I said, all of you have been like me. And you've had seasons where your light is on and you feel like nobody's around. But you've also had seasons where you feel like your light's off. Go ahead and shut it off, Bob. And if, if yours is on, he's going to be okay. And if yours is on, he's going to be okay. Even in the season when his isn't on. Even in the season where it's dark for you, if the community that you surround yourself with have theirs on, and they're living out this life for Christ, and they're in awe of who God is, and they're studying, and they're finding a way to get closer to God. Even in the moments that, that Bob's light, come with me, Bob's light goes off, he can still get around. He can still make it. He can still try to figure out what the next step is. Not because his light is so bright, because the lights around him are still helping shine the way. Amen. But how many, Scott, have you ever had a moment where your light went out? Yes, sir. Wouldn't it have been nice to have had this? Amen. How many of you have had a season in your life where the light went out? Had it not been for this, for being able to have this, what would we have done? See, this is why God said it is not good for man to be alone. He needs a body around him. He needs the church around him. Yeah, you're going to hear us say, get in a group, find a team to serve on. You're going to hear those things. And so many times people assume that's just so we can build up our volunteer base or we can make a number of, no, listen, Here's what I know. You're going to have a season where your light gets dim or goes out. And you won't know where to go if it weren't for the people around you. Thank you, Bob. Listen. You may be in this season right now. 
You may be in this season right now where you're trying to figure out what to do next. I don't know where to go. I don't, I don't. Pastor Vince, I don't have a light and I'm looking around and it's still pretty dark. Look around right now. You may not even know him. But you're here. You're close. And it's enough. It's enough to get you through.